whether to say good evening. Is it is it evening yet? Yeah. <laughs> I always get confused. I don't know if, if it's evening when it's dark. Is it, what is it? Somebody help me. Sabbath is like eight thirty. No, not when Sabbath is. But you know when people say good evening. It's typically after five. Is it after five? I think. All right. I'll go with what my dad says. Sounds good. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. You ready to study? Amen. Hope you're not as tired as I am. It's been a crazy week. <laughs> Absolutely crazy. But uh, I praise God for the Sabbath. What about you? Amen. Amen. Let's go in our Bibles to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation chapter 14. If you don't have a Bible, I know you've got a smartphone. So let's go there. We'll get there quicker. Revelation chapter 14, looking at verses 14. Revelation 14, verses 14. Leila and Carl, are you there? Are you in Revelation? They're six years old. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Amen? Father, thank you for the Sabbath. This is your time. Lead through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, thank you. Amen. Let's look at verse 14. And I looked, and behold, a what kind of cloud? White cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like unto who? The Son of Man. Having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a what? Sharp And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and do what? Reap. For the time is come for thee to reap, for the, what's the next word? Christ. Of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. You know, when I read these verses, verses 14 through 16, what we just read, it's come to be one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. Because it describes two events that I'm looking forward to. What are, what are the two events that these verses describe? The second coming and... The harvest. You know what? These are the events that I'm looking forward to. When I think of the harvest, I'm thinking of those who have died, who I love. And when they are resurrected, that's the harvest. It's going to be the biggest celebration. You know, we've all been to parties before. Some of us have been to parties in the world, right? But this party is going to be the party of all parties, right? And so I'm looking forward to this celebration when I'm reunited with all my loved ones, and I, by God's grace, my whole family is there. Amen. We're healed and we're whole, and we're flying up to meet Jesus in the air. Amen. That's what these verses talk about. Mm -hmm. Verses 14 through 16. Now, what is the message that brings about these two events? What's the message? Three angels. Three angels. Yeah, in particular, the third angel's message. So this message from verses 9, look at your Bibles now, verses 9 through 12 is the third angel. This shows you how important this message is. Because it's this message that brings on the biggest events that we're all looking forward to. Amen? Amen. The third angel's message describes two sides of people. How many sides of people? Two. There's one side that has the mark of the beast, and the other side has the seal of God. Let's look at verse 11, Revelation 14. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his what? Name. That's powerful, because those who have the mark of the beast have the mark of his name, which means the mark is affiliated with the name of the beast. The mark is affiliated with the name of the beast. Now, Bible students, we know what the name represents according to Scripture. Let's be consistent here. What does name represent? Character. Character. Exodus 33, verse 18. Exodus 34, verse 6. So those who receive the mark of the beast are in line with the character of the beast. Does that make sense? So one side has the character of the beast, and the other side has the name of the Father written on their foreheads. But notice their, their description in verse 12. Here's the other side of the third angel. Here is the patience. Anybody needed patience this week? You know, this week taught me how much I needed patience and how, how, how patience is important to your salvation. 
In your patience, possess ye your souls. That's what Jesus says. Let's continue. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that do what? And what else? So when you hear keep the commandments, what do you think? What does that mean? You keep the law, right? The Ten Commandments, Exodus 20. Notice how Jesus says what it means. Are you interested in what Jesus says? I'm interested. Let's go to John 14. I want to be this, this group that lives the third angel's message, that preaches the third angel's message, so we can bring on the harvest and the second coming. What do you say? Amen. So this group keeps the commandments. What does that mean? We say it keeps the law. Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. Amen. Notice how Jesus describes what that means. John 14, 21. I'm sure you've heard this before. Are you there? Yes. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that what? Loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will what? So according to Jesus' definition, what does it mean to keep the commandments? To love Jesus. What else? He loves you. And, and the evidence of this loving relationship is what? He shows up in your life. So when you look at this group in the last days, I don't want you to look at this description of keeping the commandments the old typical Adventist way. Let's look at it the way Jesus is approaching it. Right? These people who keep the commandments have a loving relationship with Christ. And it's evident because he shows up in their life throughout the week. Can I give you an example? This, 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 this week was crazy. I came to the conclusion that it was a supernatural attack all week. It's been crazy at work and it's never been this crazy. I'm a manager at Apple and all of a sudden there's HR issues popping up everywhere on my, and only on my team. There's other teams but only on my team. And it was testing my patience. I told somebody at work, I said, brother, I'm a Christian, but this is testing my Jesus right now. <laughs> Big time. So when somebody says something to you and, 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 and offends you and disrespects you in front of other people, the old Adam would have got on him real bad. But in that instance, Jesus showed up. <laughs> and instead of Adam wanting to retort, Adam was quiet. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't let Jesus show up all the time this week. I learned from being impatient to allow the Spirit of Christ to show up. But because I have a relationship with Him, and I'm encountering different personalities to allow His glory to shine, He manifests Himself in my life when I need Him the most to keep me from sin. And what that, what that means is, to keep me from misrepresenting his character. Mm -hmm. So to keep the commandments means you allow Christ to show up in your life. So think about what you went through this week. Have you lost your patience like I did? Yes. Don't answer, don't answer. Well, you can answer. <laughs> that was rhetorical. Did you show up when you're talking to your spouse and your children? Or did Jesus manifest? Now, if you can look throughout the week and say, man, you know what? Jesus showed up there, he showed up there, he showed up there, he showed up there, he showed up there. Guess what that means? You're keeping the commandments. You know what I'm telling people? This is powerful. You can look at the character of God by looking at Exodus 20. Would you agree with that? Yes. You look at the law of God, it's a transcript of his character. Yes. You can look at that and study that thing day or night, meditate on it, it's deep. One commandment you can spend all week meditating on it and see the character of God. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. You can do the same thing by just reflecting on the life of Christ. Reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the same thing as going to Exodus chapter 20 and reading the Ten Commandments. <laughs> I just think it's a lot more easier just to meditate on the life of Christ and see how he practically demonstrated the commandments. Are you with me this evening? 
So I believe what Jesus is saying is that this group of people in the last days allows me to show up in their lives and that's the evidence that they keep the commandments. Are you ready to study? Well, I'm going to read some scriptures in your hearing to save some time. 1 John 2 verse 3, you know this one. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So according to this verse, what does it mean to keep his commandments? We know him. We're getting a little, little bit of a different definition, right? What does it mean to keep the commandments? I, we're not going straight to exit. It means I love him. He loves me. He shows up in my life, and I know him. Does that sound good? That sounds good to me. That sounds fantastic. Now, when I look at the word keep for these people in Revelation chapter 14 who live the third angel's message, they keep the commandments. I love that word keep because that word keep means protect, to hold dear, to hold sacred, to God. Now, we're understanding that the commandments is his character. So these people hold dear the character of Christ. They keep it sacred. They don't put themselves in situations where the glory of Christ cannot be revealed. If they're in an argument with their spouse, they would rather keep their mouth closed, even if they're right, than to let the character of Jesus hit the ground. Are you with me? Yeah. This is what it means to keep the commandments. Now let's go to Matthew 19 and continue to study. Matthew 19. Matthew 19, verse 16 to 17. Are you with me? You know the story. Rich young ruler. Verse 16 to 17. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do? that I may have eternal life. And he said unto me, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, do what? Amen. Do what? Amen. The conditions have never changed. In Revelation chapter 14, there's that group who keep the commandments. Revelation 22 of the scripture here, you know it. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life. So the conditions to entering into glory is the commandments. But notice how Jesus is describing what that means to keep his commandments. And notice the angle that the rich ruler, rich ruler comes at with his understanding of what it means to keep the commandments. Are you with me this evening? Verse 18. He saith unto him, which... Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thy what? Do you find it peculiar, especially being a Seventh-day Adventist? I don't know if all of us are Seventh-day Adventists, but do you find it peculiar that Jesus only mentions the second tablet of the yes. of the Decalogue. Yes. Uh -huh. You're like, Jesus, how come you don't mention the second? How come you don't mention the first four? We need to hear that. <laughs> Is that just me? Am I tripping? Sometimes I want Jesus to say stuff like that so I can say, yes, the Sabbath is the way. Amen? But he only mentions the, the, the last, the latter half, the second tablet. He summarizes the second tablet by saying, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Wow. Amazing. Galatians 5.14. Let's get there real quick. Real quick. It's powerful. Let's remember Galatians 5.14. Galatians 5.14. Let me know when you get there by saying amen. I have the verse on my paper, so. Galatians 5.14. Amen. 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 amen? All right, let's read. For all. For all. How much of the law? All. How much? All. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt what? Love. How much of the law is fulfilled with that statement? Oh. The whole Decalogue is fulfilled in how you and I treat each other. Do I need to say it again? The whole law is fulfilled 
in how you and I treat each other. Let me say it, let me say it this way. When the character of Christ is manifest in my life, the evidence of that will be seen in how I treat you. It's fulfilled. Jesus just mentioned the relationship between each other as the fulfilling, right? So he says, when you demonstrate my character, Galatians 5, 22, 23. Let's, let's, just, let's just think about his character. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. I don't know if I have this in order. Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Those spirits, or the, not the spirit, the fruit of the spirit, right? That's the character of God. So now, if that is manifest in your life, in how you interact with your family members, that's the evidence that the law is being fulfilled. Are you with me? Notice what the rich young ruler, he, 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 he was coming from the angle that, yeah, I don't kill anybody. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't steal. Yeah, yeah, I'm honest, I don't commit adultery. It was almost as if he was coming from the angle of being the, just obeying the rules. But Jesus was coming from the angle with, of how are you treating your family members? Is my character seen in your life, in your interactions with the people of this world? He was reaching more of the spirit of the law. And here's what he, Jesus always did that because the Pharisees needed that redirection. Everybody in that time needed that re redirection because he says in Matthew 5, you have heard of old. Remember? What did he say? To not commit adultery, but I say if you commit adultery is when you look upon a woman with lust. So their definition of the law was, let's just, you know, make sure my, my clothes are ironed before the sun sets. That was their definition of the law. Jesus was trying to tell them it's more than that, it's how you treat each other. Are you with me this evening? Amen. So if I show temperance and self-control to my children, if I bring an atmosphere of peace and love and joy in the home, because I spend time with Christ every morning, if I demonstrate faith and not doubt, I can demonstrate doubt by coming into the house complaining about everything I see. Can I get a witness in here? Am I the only one that gets upset when you see dirty dishes? Especially when you tell your kid to do it? I need to demonstrate gentleness with my wife and kindness. I need to demonstrate humility. <clears throat> Amen? Amen? When this is seen, this is evidence that you're fulfilling the law. I want you to see this. Notice what Jesus says here. This is powerful. Let's continue. Are we there? Verse 20. The young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Now Jesus gets straight to the point. Notice what he says. In verse 21. Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, Matthew 19, verse 21, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have what, everyone? Treasure. Where? <laughs> and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Powerful. Powerful. See, this young brother said, I have kept the law. He didn't realize what he was saying when he said, I have kept the law. And I think sometimes we don't realize what we're saying when we say we're commandment keepers. Because what he was really saying that I believe he was ignorant of, the young ruler, is that I allow the character of Christ to shine in my life. That's what he was saying when he says, I kept the law. And so Jesus had to break it down to him from a different angle and say, okay, let me show you what's really going on in your heart. Now this is powerful to me because I learned the medical term last week, doctor, and you correct me on the spot if I'm wrong, okay? Help me, I should say, help me, right? So it's called an angiogram. It's like a procedure, right? It, it's, it, it's a procedure where a doctor is able to um, let the patient see, because from what I understand, the patient can see on the camera screen. Mm -hmm. They like put a stent in their arm, right? And they like put ink in the veins or something like that. So the patient can see the condition of his or her heart. Is that about right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Artery, but that's all right. artery, okay. But what's the purpose of it? Just to see if there's yeah. blockages in the artery? It defines the anatomy. See if there's any blockage. Block. Bingo. So, perfect. 
You and I can't see our heart. So imagine you go to the doctor, you lay down, you have this procedure performed on you, and on the screen you're able to see if there's any blockages in your heart. Jesus did an angiogram on this rich young woman. He showed him, okay, brother, you think you're all right because you're a Seventh-day Adventist and you have the law. Let me show you the condition of your heart. Now, this is mind-blowing to me. With the request to go sell all that you have and give it to the poor and come follow me, that request revealed his true status or his true uh, relationship with God. It revealed that this rich young ruler was shattering the first four commandments. Mm -hmm. This is the way Jesus revealed all first four commandments. Mm -hmm. He revealed it with this request. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or bow down to them. What was his idol that he worshipped? Wealth and money. money. Thou shalt, not take the, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Now that word take in the commandment means receive or bear. Right? Now vain means falsely or in falsehood. And we know name represents character. So don't receive my character in falsehood. Don't say I'm a Christian, but you don't act Christ-like at home. Are you with me? So he revealed to him, you're an idol worshiper, and because you're an idol worshiper, you're bearing my name in falsehood. Now, how did he break the Sabbath? This is going to blow you away. It better blow you away. It blew me away. Ezekiel 20. Ezekiel 20. You notice how you break the Sabbath. Notice how he broke the Sabbath. Ex Ezekiel. I said Ezekiel, and I'm going to ask you. Exodus. No, it's Ezekiel. I, I, I went to Exodus after I said Ezekiel. What did I say? Did I say Ezekiel? Yes. Okay, Ezekiel. I'm sorry. Ezekiel, Ezekiel 20 and verse 16. Notice how the Sabbath is broken. Are you ready? Are we there? Yes. All right. Because they despised my judgments and walked not in my statues, but polluted my Sabbaths, Notice how. For their heart went after their what? Yes. And mercy. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm sure this rich young ruler had the blue trim on his garment. I'm sure that he made sure he walked a certain distance to get to the synagogue. I'm sure his house was in order before the sun set. I'm sure all the animals were fed, everything was clean, and he was praying and rejoicing to God before the sun set. I'm sure. He probably taught a synagogue Sabbath school. <laughs> but the idol in his heart revealed that he had shattered the fourth commandment. The brother wiped out the whole first tablet. And so, and so this is powerful. Notice what Jesus says, and I'm going to read it to you. You know the verse to save time. Mark 12, 30. Notice this. Notice the principle. Mark 12, 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. What commandment is it? First. Now that means this is the priority. This is numero uno. You must get to this first before thinking about addressing the second. You get me? And the second... Notice this. It's like, namely this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Here's what Jesus is teaching. Your relationship with others. Your relationship with others. Is dependent upon your relationship with God. He was telling the rich young ruler. Who thought he was keeping the last six commandments. Actually, you're breaking all of them because your relationship with me is not where it should be. There's an idol in the way in your heart that has gotten away of our relationship, and that idol now has caused a blockage in the artery where the character of my character cannot be fully manifested in how you treat others. Is that too deep? Are you with me? 
It's like this. You can't become a black belt in karate or whatever martial arts, martial arts you pick until you have the white or the purple or the yellow or whatever color it is before the black. You can't become a general in the army until you first become a colonel or a major or whatever the ranks is before the general. You can't demonstrate a character of Christ or allow him to demonstrate a character in you and obey those six commandments if your relationship with God is in jeopardy. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. That has to be secure first. And then the, the overflow of that relationship with God will overflow into your family. Let me make it extremely plain. When I was in the world, I had many idols in my life. And I believe this to be true. I haven't even thought it all out, but I believe this to be true. Idols affect your character, and they are like blockages that keep God from manifesting His character in your life. Are you with me? They're like blockages. I had so many idols in my life. Music, movies, alcohol, drugs, you name it. And I find it interesting that my relationships with whoever I came into contact with was all messed up. Except my parents, which I barely saw at times because I was always high and I didn't want to bring my darkness around their light. You know when you're doing darkness, you run from the light. But I got fired from every job I had. I had drama galore with my, with my wife. I, I wasn't a good father to my kids. The character that I had was totally messed up, and I believe it was because the idols that were in my life. Now, I want, to, I want you to think about this as we come to a close. Who's the rich young woman today? Yes. The Bible says, Jesus says, that we are rich and increased with goods. Yes. We are the rich young woman today. A lot of us are under the impression that we have the commandments, I'm okay at home, but Jesus has performed an angiogram on us. He says there's issues in your lukewarm heart. It, it actually makes him want to throw up how much we think we're like him and we're nothing like him. And so this angiogram is to reveal what idols are in your heart. Because those who receive the mark of the beast, in the end, it's going be, to be because those idols never left. What does Jesus say in the book of Hosea at the end of Israel's, him pleading with Israel? He says, Ephraim is joined to idols. I them alone. Now I want you to do some self-examination. Idolatry is anything that takes your affection and lessens your interest in eternal things. Can I make it more plain? If you have issues drinking caffeine, it's an idol because it's a master. It tells you when to go to Starbucks. <laughs> and anything that whips you like that, Game of Thrones, is a master because it tells you when to watch the next episode. Anything that's addicting in nature is primarily an idol. Now these things is a, creates a blockage that prohibits the character of Christ from manifesting itself in all its glory. If anything, these idols create the opposite traits. Can I make it more plain? I'm trying to close. When you drink caffeine and you don't have it, you become impatient. You become irritable. That's the opposite of Christ's temperance. Amen? When you watch these shows that are addicting, by beholding, you become and whether you like it or not, these attributes, these characteristics are in your life as seeds and they will bear fruit. They may not bear fruit tomorrow, but someday they will bear fruit. So whatever the idol is, it will prohibit that glory of God from manifesting itself in your life. And so the surgeon is standing in front of you today as he did the rich young boo. He's already performed the angiogram on us. We know what the idols are. And he knows. And he's standing with your heart in his hand right now. 
And he's looking at you with eager anticipation as he looked at the rich young ruler. I can imagine Jesus was excited because he's the surgeon. You know, a surgeon can't force the patient to get on the table. The table has to choose and say, doctor, I trust you to operate. And Jesus is saying, look, I'm so good at what I do. I have a 100% success rate. I've never failed an operation. Any blockage in your heart, I can remove. Better yet, all of my surgery, I got, I got a million testimonies of people that's been through successful surgeries by my hand. And they'll tell you that when I'm done operating on their heart, not only can I remove that idol, that heart is beating stronger like it's never beat before. They tell you it's a brand new heart. And all of a sudden, they're able to allow my character to shine in their lives. They're able to be quiet where before they used to speak up. They're able to be humble. They're able to be kind. They're able to demonstrate faith to their family. Are you with me this evening? Amen. So Christ is asking, will you trust me? Will you trust me with that idol? All the rich young ruler had to do. You see, he was worried. And this is us. He was worried. Man, what am I going to do? I got all these riches. What about my family? How am I going to take care of them? How, how am I going to provide? If I, you're telling me to sell everything and let it go. And the surgeon is like, trust me. Many of us don't come to Jesus because you worry. What's going to happen? What about this? What about that? And Jesus is saying, just let it go and come. Amen. If only the rich young ruler knew who, who he was talking to. He was talking to the richest person in all the universe. He thought he had some riches. Jesus, Jesus was like, brother, you don't know the mansion I got for you right now. He told him, he said, I'll give you treasure in heaven. Just come. And God is making the plea to the rich young ruler. All of us. That thing that grips you. Fall on your knees in front of the master and plead with him to operate. You don't have to have all the answers. He does. Just give him your heart. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. The Bible says, Lord, that you break the iron and brass asunder. Moses calls you a man of war. David says you're most valiant. Mm -hmm. The Bible says in Isaiah and many other scriptures, you're the captain of the host. When you walk this earth, Lord Jesus, the enemy was scared, fell down and bowed to your will. He had no power whatsoever. Lord, what's, what's keeping us? I want to pray specifically, Lord, for the people in this room who are struggling with idols. I want to come against the spirit of idolatry in the name of Jesus. And I'm asking that the spirit of Christ, the spirit of power and resurrection, would break the bonds asunder and destroy the power and the lines of that idol. I'm praying, oh Father, that you would water the seed that was planted tonight. And that the idol and the enemy wouldn't take it away after we leave this place. That throughout the sacred hours of the Sabbath, you would claim our hearts as your territory. Everybody under the sound of my voice. In the name of Jesus. precious blood of the Lamb was slain for every soul in this place. And there's power in the blood. Amen. Our God, help thou our unbelief. Amen. That we would let go and trust you. Walk away and trust you. Help us to keep our eyes on your eyes. And I plead, Lord, that there will be no one in this room that will turn away like that young man did. Mm -hmm. 
In Jesus' name, let everyone say, Amen. Amen.